Hello and welcome to another Ohio Health EMS online learning opportunity. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the system EMS medical director for Ohio Health. And today I'm joined by Dr. Ryan Squire, one of our medical directors at our freestanding emergency departments, one of our EMS medical directors. And Ryan also serves as the past president of Ohio ASAP. And today we're going to talk about the evolution of emergency department care within Ohio Health, specifically focusing on the freestanding emergency department network. Dr. Squire, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Cortez, thank you for the introduction and uh, happy to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever uh, this may catch you, you uh, listening to this. And I appreciate everyone taking a time to um, join us uh, to talk kind of really about the evolution of uh, emergency department care. Um, within Ohio, if we look back over the past 15 years, there's been a huge kind of evolution of uh, emergency departments and what they look like. Um, in particular, we, when we look within the Ohio Health Network, looking at what that means and not only our emergency departments on main campuses, uh, but um, at our freestanding uh, emergency departments and the number of bed that's simply added um, to uh, our facilities uh, across the state. Um, again, I, I do serve as the Associate Medical Director of the Ohio Health New Albany Freestanding Emergency Department, and I work with Mid-Ohio Emergency Services. The objectives of uh, today's discussion is understanding the spectrum of capabilities of freestanding emergency departments within Ohio Health. We want to understand the structure and capabilities as well as the staffing model of each specific location. Um, part of uh, understanding what a freestanding emergency department is and what that, that is, is, is the benefit that it truly provides the communities. Um, here in 2021, we've we've been met with some historic volumes, you know, across uh, the state in terms of emergency department visits, um, and it really has helped take uh, a lot of that volume and disperse it uh, throughout uh, different facilities. Um, understanding that these freestanding emergency departments really are an asset to the community to uh, allow uh, quick uh, access to care uh, by board certified emergency medicine physicians. And in understanding kind of what these freestanding emergency departments are and how they operate, our goal is to help uh, EMS and freestanding emergency departments work best uh, to improve the care for our communities. Uh, again, disclosure, I work solely within the Ohio Health System and work with Mid-Ohio Emergency Services. So what, what is a freestanding emergency department? Here, um, you can see a map that, that takes a, a small component of uh, Ohio Health's um, emergency departments that exist within the central Ohio area only, though if we expand this map, we catch the kind of the greater scope of what we're talking about. A freestanding emergency department is a facility that receives individuals for emergency care and is structurally separate and distinct from a hospital. Ultimately, freestanding emergency departments are here. They're here likely to stay. And it's important that as these continue to uh, be apparent in our communities, that we understand what they serve and what purpose they serve, uh, particularly in helping bring some of that volume that we're seeing in some of the main hospital sites down, um, particularly for some things that may be lower acuity, but still do need uh, emergency medicine care. Um, Ultimately, Ohio, um, as a state, has some of the largest volume of freestanding emergency departments, not to the extent that we're seeing in an area like perhaps Texas, uh, but also many of the freestanding emergency departments within the state of Ohio are tied directly with hospital systems, uh, which makes them uh, fundamentally a little bit different than um, what someone may hear if you hear you know, arguments made about um, those that exist in states like Texas. Um, in the last decade alone, uh, within Central Ohio, both Ohio Health and Mount Carmel have expanded uh, freestanding emergency departments, and even Ohio State um, has entered into this in kind of a slightly separate um, but distinct role, um, and it is expanding the number of beds we have to deliver emergency care. When we talk about specifically Ohio Health, and, and during um, this discussion, we want to talk specifically what does Ohio Health uh, have to offer. You see this uh, continuum of care from uh, urgent cares on you know the left side of this um, you know continuum, where you're going to see obviously your lower acuity individuals, 
And then you're looking at these, what are, are framed a retail freestanding emergency department, um, which is gonna be our eight bed emergency departments, whether it be like Ontario, Ashland, um, Powell, uh, New Albany, Hilliard, uh, Obetz, Reynoldsburg, Lewis Center. Um, and then your freestanding ED on a medical campus, would, which would be like um, your Pickerington, uh, Westerville, and then obviously your ED on a, a hospital campus. As you go to the, in the higher acuity places, you're going to have a great deal more resources, and that's very important to understand, uh, particularly um, as we look at those, you know, what are framed as the retail freestanding EDs on this, this uh, continuum. So when we talk about um, Ohio Health Westerville Medical Campus and Ohio Health Pickerington Medical Campus, each of them are a 16-bed emergency department. Um, the staffing of such involves a board-certified emergency medicine physician. You have an advanced practice provider, two to six registered nurses, depending on the time of the day. You have a, may have a medic and or a licensed uh, practical nurse, social worker at certain hours, uh, a pharmacist that is on site, as well as a general radiology and CT technologist. In addition, uh, many times you will have uh, security present at these sites. When we talk about our uh, freestanding emergency departments, which uh, again, I had kind of outlined earlier, these are um, eight bed emergency departments. Um, you have a board certified emergency medicine physician. You have a advanced uh, practice provider that may or may not be present. You have two to three registered nurses, general radiology, CT technologist, and a registration individual. Um, obviously going even just from that Westerville Pickerington, um, location to these eight bed freestanding emergency departments, you see a significant decrease um, in the number of staff that are present on site. So when every emergency department within specifically Central Ohio is um, opened, uh, we kind of fill out questionnaires with the Central Ohio trauma system uh, so that we can help delineate what things we can or perhaps we may not be well equipped uh, to do. Um, and so it's important um, looking at these and especially understanding that you have a board certified emergency medicine physician at uh, each of these sites. Our capability of stabilizing patients is, is uh, at, at the top of our game. Uh, and we have that capability at almost all of those sites. You know, obviously inpatient beds are not available um, in your eight bed freestanding emergency departments nor are they gonna be available in kind of your Westerville or Pickerington locations as it stands right now. Though there are some observation level beds for patients that may be deemed kind of low acuity, uh, that maybe need you know, very uh, mild care, but not necessarily kind of inpatient care with specialist involvement as you'd see in, in a hospital emergency department. Um, the goal with um, obviously these criteria being answered as these sites open, is as EMS looks to where should we get the patient, is looking to get the right patient to the right hospital environment in the right amount of time the first time to minimize discomfort, expense, risk, and time associated with hospital to hospital transfers. And in the current environment that we exist right now, I, I can't stress this enough. Um, when we have patients in our freestanding emergency departments um, that uh, ultimately require admission, um, we unfortunately are looking at time periods of you know, sometimes uh, upwards of a day uh, waiting for getting that patient into the hospital. Um, and sometimes looking at time periods uh, that extend past an eight to 12 hour time period, just to be able to uh, identify an appropriate EMS agency to transport a patient that needs that continuation of care. All of these emergency departments, especially operating under that of a hospital system, operate under the auspice of an EMTALA. And thus, any individual that arrives at that facility seeking care uh, will receive that care uh, under EMTALA. And I believe um, Dr. Cortez and I both have done previous uh, discussions um, with regard to EMTALA and its importance. It is really one of the governing aspects of uh, emergency medicine uh, that we need to understand uh, in its entirety. So, yeah, you know, we are a freestanding emergency department, and you know, understanding that, as I said previously, uh, we may be you know very good at stabilizing a number of things, but we also don't have specialists at our our sites. And certain certain 
uh, patients and we can identify them quickly in a pre-hospital arena, uh, the ones that definitely uh, are gonna need specialist involvement or need more staff uh, hands uh, on deck um, to help uh, provide appropriate care for that patient. These include you know, an acute MI, a STEMI needs to go to a PCI center. A uh, patient that's in active labor should go to a, a facility that has OBGYN capabilities, uh, particularly with the complications that could arise during a labor. Trauma activation patients you know, need the benefits of having you know, not just trauma surgery, but potential specialty uh, surgery uh, services that are available uh, in a, a level one trauma center. Um, Post-operative complications uh, that could arise after an individual had recently had surgery, um, they want to be at the hospital where that surgeon is um, in case that there is a need uh, for some uh, added input um, or uh, continuation of care from that surgery. Um, acute psychiatric emergencies. Um, patients that are combative, uh, patients that um, we're concerned are an elopement risk um, or might need a sitter. Um, patients that you know, may be voicing active thoughts of self-harm, um, all of these are gonna be best served and many times out of main you know, uh, hospital emergency department because of the resources uh, that are involved in their care and, and ensuring that, that they're in the safest place for them. And again, the right uh, hospital environment at the right time. Um, intoxicated patients also um, not a good um, fit for a freestanding emergency department, particularly in light of the, the unpredictable nature uh, that they can present um, and can go from you know, what seemed to be you know, re relatively docile um, and to combative in you know, a you know, few minutes. And we've seen that you know, unfortunately in some of our sites. So you know, unstable patients in the pre-hospital uh, environment, uh, we as emergency medicine physicians understand that uh, EMS, um, has um, a difficult job, particularly in, you know, walking into a scene, whether it be you know, on the side of the road or into someone's home where they might be squeezing down you know, packed uh, hallways. Um, it, it can be a difficult environment to provide optimal care, uh, particularly even once we get the patient uh, on the back of uh, the ambulance. Um, it is difficult to continue you know, certain things um, that may be time uh, sensitive. You know, if we're running a code, um, if we have a difficult airway. Um, some of these freestanding emergency departments will offer an opportunity of a spot where EMS can come to get some additional assistance and then potentially continue on um, by you know, stopping for a short time, uh, using the skills, using the availability of some of the tools that are in the freestanding environment um, and that the emergency medicine physician is well capable of uh, operating uh, to provide additional uh, care for this patient and hopefully stabilize to then continue on to uh, a larger tertiary center. Uh, it's completely appropriate for uh, EMS um, to you know, come by you know, in a cardiac arrest uh, a situation uh, where they are seeking some additional assistance, perhaps with a difficult airway, uh, perhaps you know, with uh, getting um, access to be able to administer uh, potentially life-saving drugs. Um, but at the same point, uh, there may be that ask for EMS to stand by uh, so that we can work as a team. And that's what emergency medicine is. It's a team uh, you know, sport, in, including the emergency medicine physician, the emergency medicine nurses, RT, as well as EMS. Uh, we all work in this together uh, to do what's best for all of our community. So at this point, you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of walk through some cases uh, with uh, Dr. Cortez, uh, you know, walking through kind of different scenarios of patients that uh, I know many of, of you likely have gotten called on and kind of talk what, where, where might this patient um, best land? What, what might be a, a good spot to take this patient uh, or what might not be a good one and kind of talk through why and why not? Um, and so my, my first, you know, you know, first scenario uh, called on a 20 year old male with sudden onset right flank pain. Uh, it started four hours earlier. Um, he's had associated nausea and vomiting. As you can see vitals, he has a little tachycardia with heart rate of 110, otherwise unremarkable. Uh, EMS is able to initiate an IV and provide some Zofran per protocol. And now, uh, 
kind of looking kind of wh where do we take this patient here? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, this is a it's seemingly 20 year old male that's relatively healthy. Uh, I don't think this guy has any associated medical problems. Uh, looking at the vital signs, they all look relatively stable. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a time critical diagnosis that's occurring. Uh, EMS was able to start an IV and uh, start treatment with Zofran. Thinking about what this individual may need, um, potentially blood work, potentially an evaluation of his urine, and maybe some advanced imaging, such as an ultrasound or CAT scan, um, which all of those things can happen at a freestanding emergency department. And the probability of this individual uh, requiring admission is probably pretty low. Uh, so I would feel comfortable with uh, EMS personnel transporting to a freestanding in this case. Dr. Squire, what do you think? Yeah, and Dr. Cortez, exactly. I think this is a great opportunity for uh, you know taking a patient to a freestanding emergency department where they have that capability of you know it, it's again a sudden onset flank pain um, and un, a young individual it sounds very much like what we might see with like a kidney stone. And in that, you know, we can give medication to help provide comfort. We can look at their urine. We can run point of care labs, um, looking to see what their kidney function looks like. Um, and then, you know, we can do a CAT scan um, and see is there is there a kidney stone or is it something you know else that might be causing that. Um, for all intensive purposes, aside from you know the tachycardia, vital signs are stable. Um, and uh, again, I think you know a freestanding emergency department would be an optimal you know care. Uh, point for an individual like this. And uh, again, with them all throughout kind of the Ohio health system, uh, many times it's gonna be a lot closer for EMS to be transporting something like this uh, to one of those freestanding emergency departments as compared to being out of service for a longer period of time in order to transport to a, a larger facility. So. So second scenario, a uh, 35 year old combative psychiatric patient um, calls the scene where patients found confused and is another crew's already on scene and combative uh, with, um, and the patient is combative with that crew. Um, ultimately the patients required restraint for safe transport and have to pull some additional crew members on uh, the ambulance for transport. Um, ketamine is administered 300 milligrams IM and vitals um, after ketamine administration, because we were unable to obtain them uh, before its administration, show a temp of 99.3. Patient's tachycardic with a heart rate of 130, and he's currently on a non rebreather with a pulse ox at 98%. This is another challenging patient for EMS to make some tough decisions. Um, my interpretation of this case presentation is this is a behavioral emergency. And I think behavioral emergencies, we don't oftentimes consider them with STEMIs and strokes and traumas, but they are really emergencies and in some circumstances can be time critical uh, in nature as well. So I think if the circumstances were right for EMS personnel, going to a non freestanding ED would probably be most appropriate. Uh, there are some exceptions, you know, if EMS, uh, if the personnel were concerned about their safety and felt like they couldn't make it to a emergency department, then I think diverting to a freestanding to help stabilize would be appropriate. Also, with the medical uh, aspect of it, uh, with ketamine being administered, uh, with vital signs that are okay, but that heart rate's getting up there at 130. The respiratory rate is 22. There's a non rebreather on, so was was the patient hypoxic as well. So if there was a concern about the instability of the patient, then maybe you divert to the closer freestanding ED. But if those exceptions aren't present, then going to an emergency department over a freestanding would be best from my perspective. And Dr. Cortez, I uh, agree a hundred percent. I think the 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 big you know takeaway here is. Uh, we're already requiring four crew members to help, you know, with transporting this patient. And if you know, recall looking looking at what our staffing looks like at some of the freestanding emergency departments, where we may have a physician, you know, two nurses, um, a radiology tech, um, and you know, perhaps a registration person. So 
I may have five, you know, total staff members present there, um, in addition to, you know, other patients that we're trying to care for. Um, and, you know, just, you know, the patients, you know, being combative, what, what may or may not be going on, we're not quite certain right now, but there's assuredly some additional testing that we're going to need, and we're going to need some staff um, support in order to ensure that that can safely be done for the patient safety, as well as for the safety of all of our staff members. And for an instance like this, um, especially when we've already got a combative individual, it many times will be best to go to a site where um, we have the support of you know, multiple staff members and perhaps the ability to have you know, one on one you know, nursing coverage for that patient, as well as the potential you know, benefit of just having you know, protective services present um, uh, should the need arise. Um, and again, any of the freestanding emergency departments uh, currently do not have that uh, benefit of you know, protective services uh, to provide that additional support. Um, and so an instance like this, I would um, definitely defer to um, getting to a, a, a main campus um, tertiary center. Um, I would, I, you know, again, just like you said, if, if there is a concern for, um, you know, EMS safety, I would 100% uh, invite um, a, a quick stop um, within a freestanding emergency department to help stabilize, uh, to ensure, um, you know, perhaps, you know, adequate, you know, sedation, um, and, you know, continue on. Um, so, next scenario, um, we got a 40-year-old individual who is um, intoxicated. He's at a local watering hole uh, when he's fallen from a bar stool and struck his head. Um, uh, you enter the scene, find a patient that's confused with obvious signs of head trauma. He is opening his eyes spontaneously. He's moving all his extremities. Um, there's no bystanders that are uh, with the patient. Um, we've got vital signs that, you know, largely appear okay, aside from his pulse oximeter, which is a little low at 94%. Um, and so we've got an individual who fell, sustained a head injury, um, and has some alteration in mental status. Dr. Cortez? Yeah, this is another tough one. You're, you're um, choosing hard ones and not straightforward ones, Dr. Squire, but... Um... So this is always a challenge for EMS when you have alcohol involved. And in some cases, it's just plain alcohol intoxication or intoxication from any substance. But uh, one of the keys to evaluating these folks is thinking about alcohol plus. So is it alcohol plus trauma or alcohol plus DKA or alcohol plus X, Y, or Z emergency? And a lot of times there's other stuff that's going on. And in this case, you, you know, it's in alcohol intoxication with obvious head trauma. You know, he's confused, so I'm not exactly sure what his GCS is, but I suspect that it's not 15. Uh, vital signs are, are okay. Uh, there's uh, no bystanders with the patient. Uh, so that makes it challenging um, when we talk about watching the patient in the ED to sober up and so forth. You know, so in this case, when there's alcohol plus something else going on, um, the fact that he's alone, um, that would point me more towards an emergency department rather than a freestanding ED. Um, because there's probably going to be some form of advanced imaging that occurs in a workup of that trauma. And um, intoxicated individuals, especially those that lack capacity, uh, and the guy in that picture looks like he lacks capacity, uh, will need to be watched in the ED and, and supervised by um, a patient sitter. And uh, sometimes these individuals do have a tendency um, to uh, develop abnormal behavior or some agitation or combativeness as they begin to sober up or as their traumatic injuries worsen. And uh, again, excellent, you know, Dr. Cortez, I agree um, with you. Uh, a lot of times uh, we can have the potential of like biasing ourselves uh, with patients and, and sometimes seeing, you know, an individual that's uh, intoxicated, we may bias ourselves to say that the behavior that we're seeing um, is solely because of that intoxication, whether it be alcohol, um, whether it be some, you know, other substance. And the key is getting past that bias and understanding, you know, that there is in the, the potential for more. 
And we've got an instance here where there is clear signs of head trauma, and I would defer to going to a, a main hospital emergency department uh, because of the fact that our freestandings do not have the capability of obtaining alcohol levels. Um, and again, when you're looking at a patient who may require, you know, something like having, you know, a, a sitter or enacting a, a medical hold, uh, which again, Dr. Cortez, you and I have had the ability to talk about that in a separate lecture about, you know, es establishing patients' capacities and, and whether we do need to enact a medical hold for their safety, uh, whether it's because they're impaired from um, a substance, whether they have some impaired judgment, um, or uh, whether, you know, they are at risk of harming themselves or someone else. And so an in individual like this, um, they it seems like it's, it's more than just, you know, potentially that, you know, alcohol and would defer to a, a main hospital emergency department because of kind of the resources that are involved in this case. Hey, Dr. Squire, so you mentioned a few times the uh, medical legal uh, presentation slash discussion that we had. So that involves a discussion of MTALA, uh, a mental capacity assessment and form refusals. That's on Ohio Health EMS.com on under our online learning and you can access that and it's for free if you'd like to delve into those topics in more detail. Um, and then the second thing is, do you mind just commenting briefly on, you know, what would happen to this 40 year old when they're in an ED? What what types of studies are going to be ordered and what are you evaluating for? And how long do you think this individual would be in the ED before he would be discharged if there was nothing found from a traumatic standpoint? Great question. And so, you know, obviously, you know, you, you've got an individual who at the scene, we can see they have obvious signs of head trauma. So once they get to the emergency department, the big thing is, is, is getting them into a, a gown so that we can completely evaluate them. And that may happen even uh, within the trauma bay in an instance like this, so that we can evaluate because we can't trust the current uh, mental state that they're in to identify potential other injuries, you know, and say, you ended up, you know, taking off this gentleman's shirt and found, you know, significant bruising to the chest wall, suggesting not only did he fall and hit his head, uh, but perhaps um, something happened, you know, some sort of traumatic injury, whether he was, you know, hit or stomped in his chest or struck his chest against something, you know, prior to um, that fall. Um, and so you're looking at, you know, one, a, a, a thorough examination and then advanced imaging, you know, likely, you know, CAT scans, perhaps, you know, x-rays. Um, you're looking at laboratory studies, you know, including the potential of getting, you know, alcohol level or looking for confounding substances. Plenty of time there an individual might look like they're intoxicated from alcohol, uh, but perhaps it's from, you know, another substance and we need to know that. Um, and if it's not that and we don't, then we need to figure out why they're so, you know, altered. Um, if it is alcohol, we also have to understand, you know, we're looking at a significant amount of time for them to metabolize that. Um, you know, if they're a regular drinker, we may be more comfortable with them leaving the department before one would consider them legally sober uh, because of the fact we don't want them to go through, you know, withdrawal. But at the same time, we want to make sure that they're alert, they're oriented, they're able to uh, function, you know, and ambulate uh, prior to them leaving, you know, the department. And many times, an individual like this, you're looking at uh, a minimum of, you know, four to six hours um, in an emergency department. Thank you, Ryan. That was helpful. So, uh, next scenario, and uh, particularly um, pertinent for the current environment we all find ourselves in, you know, a 46 year old known COVID positive patient uh, call for shortness of breath. Upon arrival, patient is known to be tachypnic, uh, sitting on his recliner at home. Patient reportedly became symptomatic seven days earlier. He had tests performed. Uh, on uh, day uh, two of symptoms with detection of COVID. Upon uh, arrival at the patient's home, he is known to have a temp of 102. He's got a heart rate of 123. His blood pressure is 118 over 72. Respiratory rate is 28. And he's satting 75% on room air, uh, up to 94% on four liters. All right, so looking at this patient from an EMS perspective, uh, sick or not sick, this 46-year-old is on the sick end of the spectrum. Um, certainly, COVID is concerning, and, and um, he's been symptomatic for several days. 
Uh, looking at the vital signs, you have uh, an elevated temperature, a heart rate, uh, an elevated respiratory rate, and profound hypoxia as well. So, putting all that together, you're worried about sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock potentially, uh, and you're also worried about hypoxic respiratory failure as well. Um, so, this is one of those gray areas where, you know, the freestanding ED is certainly capable of stabilizing this patient, evaluating the patient, uh, but 100 times out of 100, this patient's going to need to be admitted to the hospital uh, for all those reasons that I just listed. So, uh, if EMS personnel would feel comfortable uh, potentially bypassing a freestanding to go to an emergency department, I think that is the most efficient um, decision for the patient and for the system as well, uh, as long as EMS personnel feel comfortable with that and they're able to do the things that they need to do uh, before the patient gets to the ED. So, for example, if blood pressure would be dropping and they can't get an IV, then certainly divert to a freestanding. If the pulse ox starts dropping down and you're unable to secure an airway or ventilate, then certainly divert to the freestanding. But uh, thinking about what is ultimately going to happen with this patient, uh, going to an emergency department is probably the best option over a freestanding. Dr. Squire. Dr. Cortez, I appreciate that. And, and just in clarification, too, and, you know, when uh, Dr. Cortez recommends going to an emergency department, our freestanding emergency departments are, are all emergency departments. And, and I know that his, his um, referencing that is, is suggesting that we go to a, you know, hospital um, based emergency department because of we're looking at a facility. This again, when we were talking about the COTS uh, uh, tool, we're looking to get the patient to the right facility in the right amount of time. Um, and, and this is an instance where this individual needs to be admitted in the hospital. Um, they're requiring supplemental oxygen. Um, they're going to require some you know, additional support. Uh, we've seen over the past year and a half that individuals with you know, COVID um, typically will kind of have that fall off period at about day that's seven to 10. Um, and this is where that individual is. And so ideally getting this patient to a hospital-based emergency department uh, will be ideal so that we can get him into an inpatient bed, whether that be in the ICU or a regular medical floor, um, so that he can receive you know, the best care that they, they can get um, for this. Um, you know, going to a freestanding emergency department, can we provide oxygen? Yes. Um, we don't have the capabilities of uh, the antiviral drugs that have been approved for treatment are not staffed uh, in the uh, freestanding emergency departments. And then also getting you know, some of the more specialists involved, pulmonary uh, critical care um, that may be involved in, in, in uh, optimal care for this patient are not going to be available on site in one of our freestandings. And so this is an instance where, uh, again, maybe going down the road another you know, 10 minutes uh, will ultimately get that patient to the appropriate site for care um, quicker and many times hours quicker than you know um, having them you know taken taken to a uh, freestanding emergency environment. Yeah, thanks, Ryan, uh, for clarifying that. Yeah, hospital emergency department versus freestanding emergency department uh, is what I was referring to. Thank you. Um, and then you know, last uh, scenario: you have a seventy-year-old uh, who had a witnessed arrest uh, in the Powell area. Um, at 5 p.m. Um, ultimately, EMS is called to the home. Family is providing active compressions um, and uh, he's loaded into the ambulance. Uh, ACLS protocols continued with uh, after establishing an IV. However, despite multiple attempts, uh, EMS is unable to establish an airway. Yeah, this is one of those examples where um, from an EMS perspective, if things are going well, and you can get to definitive care uh, in a reasonable amount of time, then I have no problem with EMS personnel bystanding a freestanding ED to go to a hospital-based ED. Uh, but in this scenario, um, 5 p.m. suggests that there could be uh, some transport delays because of traffic and rush hour. Also, the, the things that need to get done en route to the hospital, such as securing an airway, are difficult and they're unable to get completed. So in this scenario, I would encourage 
uh, going to the closest, most appropriate facility. And in this case, if, if this freestanding ED was the closest facility, then I would have no problem with EMS going there uh, to facilitate the airway and um, c continue with the cardiac arrest resuscitation. And I, I agree, Dr. Cortez, it's, this, this is an instance where, um, you know, we've got an individual who's, you know, very much, you know, 10, 15 minutes away from a hospital based emergency department. Um, current, you know, recommendations on ACLS are, you know, high quality uh, compressions are, are very important. And the fact that we'd be able to continue that and perhaps stop um, at that Powell freestanding emergency department utilize some of the resources that we have and some of the capabilities in a larger environment um, to secure an airway um, and so that continued care can be uh, provided um, and then continue on. Uh, I, I specifically call out Powell because I know for a fact that um, you know the Powell Freestanding Emergency Department has seen a number of scenarios just like this uh, where a local EMS has stopped by they have worked in conjunction with our team at the you know, Powell Freestanding Emergency Department um, because, again, that's how we as emergency medicine doctors look at um, the care we provided. It is a team uh, environment and things work best when we work as a team. But they, as uh, EMS, have worked alongside our nurses and our physician, uh, provided great care, secured airways, got ROSC, and then they've continued on to one of our main hospitals for continuation of care of that patient. Um, and so um, this is a great opportunity um, for um, us all to, one, get to know each other a little bit better, work together, um, and uh, help our communities in an instance like this. So um, in closing, um, I just ask that we all work on understanding where the freestanding emergency departments uh, fit within the continuum of care within Central Ohio, as well as within Ohio Health. Um, the idea of a freestanding emergency department um, is going to be around. Um, it is the natural evolution of what emergency medicine has become. And we need to understand as these continue to be present within our communities, what the available resources are, what might be the optimal you know, patient populations to be treated in such, as well as the potential limitations that might be present for certain treatment. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk anytime with anyone uh, on site uh, about uh, what care can or cannot be done, um, as well as what you know limitations or, or what may be uh, ideal to bring uh, to any of these sites. And I thank everyone involved with EMS for everything you guys do, not just, you know, in the current you know, uh, COVID environment, but always, uh, because you guys are always there. Um, and it's always a pleasure uh, being able to work together with you um, and helping our communities. Thank you, Dr. Spire, that was excellent. Um, if any of our listeners have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. I can help answer those questions, uh, but most likely I'll refer them on to Dr. Squire uh, for input as well. Uh, but please feel free to reach out with any uh, concerns, comments, or questions. Uh, we certainly want to be your resource as we work through um, navigating the freestanding ED network. We want to do what's best for the patient. Uh, we want to help support you as EMS providers as well. Uh, so please just reach out to us for anything that we can help you with. Uh, be sure to check this out on ohiohealthems.com. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of online free learning that you have access to as well that can help supplement some of the topics that we discussed today as well. We appreciate your time and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.